Good morning and welcome to the fourth session of OSU Extension's Virtual Soil Health Series. I'm Mary Griffith, o Extension Educator in Madison County, Ohio, and our webinar today will focus on cover crop management. So uh, our guest speakers today are Dr. Hans Koch and Eric Niemeyer. We're going to start with a presentation from Hans, who is an independent agricultural conservation consultant based out of Indianapolis. He is a project director with the Conservation Technology Information Center and lead agronomist for the Indiana Infield Advantage Network. He was one of the founding members of the Indiana Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative and helped launch the Soil Health Partnership. Following the presentation from Hans, he will be joined by Eric Niemeyer and they will tackle the Q&A portion together. Eric farms about 600 acres in Delaware County, Ohio, all no-till, all 100% um, covered with a multi-species covered crop. He plants 100% green, uses a roller crimper for mechanical termination, and has a custom-built high boy, which he uses to do custom cover crop application. Um, so I'm very happy to have both of these guys here today. Between our two guests, we hope to have a really dynamic Q&A session where we can address a wide range of questions. So please be ready to ask um, questions. I thank you both for being here. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Hans. Thank you and good morning. And like you said, Mary, we should be able to go a little longer uh, with question and answer as long as there are question and answers coming in, at least on my part. All right, let me share my screen with you. See whether mine works, Sarah. There we go. Can you please confirm that that's up? Yes, it is. Okay, great, thank you. Good morning. Um, cover crop management. Uh, boy, hot topic. Um, yet, only about 2% of the acres uh, are under cover crop in the Midwest, and in some areas, it's even a lot less. So I am an expert in death by PowerPoint. We're not going to do that today. Uh, I figured uh, there are too many questions. Uh, you are less interested in hearing what I have to say rather than getting your questions answered. So what I'd like to do this morning with about a very short presentation, uh, share the time with Eric Niemeyer, uh, who you were just introduced to and address your submitted questions uh, that were submitted in the last couple uh, webinars. And if there's time, we'll get into the chat room after that. A uh, couple assumptions. And looking at the last poll, that assumption may be wrong, uh, since there was quite a few people that haven't done uh, cover crops yet. But I make the assumption that you know the basics of cover crops, at least. And if you don't, I hope you're aware there are many, many resources for Covers 101. Uh, there are tons of websites, YouTubes, publications, uh, local farmers that do that. And of course you have an extension office, NRCS and the Soil and Water Conservation District locally that can provide a lot of information. I do not know for sure about Ohio, but I know that in Indiana, we have extensively trained our uh, local offices uh, in cover crop management on both the basics and the more advanced uh, issues with cover crops. And those people are aware of it. So the questions that came in, um, I'll, I'll just throw them up here for you. The, the most common one was the timing of cover crops, uh, the planting of them and termination of cover crops. So we'll go into that. And then I always get that question, which is the best cover crop? And yes, we're gonna hit that head on. Cereal rye, most used cover crop. So the most questions on that one. Herbicides always comes up. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the economics of cover crops. You're gonna spend $30 or so an acre, maybe more to put cover crops in there. How can you make that money back? And Eric has some great information on that and I have some other sources uh, on that information. And then uh, there were, uh, was a sprinkling of funny questions about cover crops, uh, improved cover crops, uh, endophyte resistant cover crops and all that. So we'll, we'll talk about that briefly. So let's start with the timing of the cover crops and let's start with planting. So let's put the whole thing in perspective. Why are we using cover crops? And if we look at our field from throughout the entire year, we are basically only using our farm fields for five months if we're in a corn or soybean rotation. If we grow winter wheat, which has really gone out pretty much, uh, we use it a little longer, of course, but five months out of the year, we use the fields. So seven months, 
we do not use our field, which is basically unused solar energy. Now, granted, uh, looking outside my window in Indianapolis here, everything is snow covered and uh, there's ice on the ground. Uh, so yeah, there's not much growing there. Uh, my cover crops in my garden have pretty much froze out and my clovers are kind of dormant right now. Not much happening, but with cover crops, we can double about the time that we grow something in the field. For five months, we can probably grow something now for 10 months, which is fabulous for the soil biology, for erosion control, for nutrient uh, uh, uptake, and you, you know the whole list of things cover crops can do for us. However, if we want to be successful with those cover crops, it's very important to realize where we are. Somebody in Lawrence County, in the very south of the state, can do a lot more with different cover crops than somebody in Lucas County in the, in the area of Toledo. Uh, and that is important to know what your limitations are. And there's a great resource out there, the Midwest Cover Crop Council, they have a cover crop to a simulator uh, decision tool that can tell you what the planting dates for all your cover crops are. So Midwest Cover Crop Council, cover crop decision tool. Look that up um, and, and that can really help you make that decision when the cover crops go in. But one thing we have all in common, both south and north, we need to get those cover crops in at the earliest we can. Here's an uh, image of uh, some uh, annual ryegrass uh, planted on September 15 on the top of the picture and planted on October 15 at the bottom of the picture. Picture was taken November 4th. Huge difference out there. Now, most of us might still have a crop in the field on September 15 and wait till that October 15 date, but that is really hampering our efforts on what we can do with cover crops. If we have wheat in rotation, that opens up a large window. Uh, if we live far south, we may be able to hit that September 15 date, but pretty much September, mid-September for most of the state is your cutoff. Anything after September 15 that, that has any chance of growing is cereal rye. So if you want to do anything else, you have to find other ways to get the cover crop in. And yes, in the questions that were answered, I had a lot of complaints about aerial cover crop seeding and... Um, the big thing about aerial seeding cover crops, of course, is that number one, you have to rely on some rain for the cover crop to come up because the seed is just laying on the ground. You're limited on what you can seed because large seeded uh, cover crops like uh, peas will not work out of an airplane, at least not reliably. Our experience is that if you have been no-telling for a while, and this is not your first time using cover crops, aerial application generally works fairly well. Uh, the other option, of course, this is Eric, by the way. Thanks for that picture, Eric. Uh, with his high boy going into standing corn to plant his cover crops to make sure he gets them in before that September deadline. Some farmers have even gone a little farther. They are interseeding their cover crops when the corn is very little. And this picture is uh, corn at about V5 or so. This works really well north of I-70, basically. The Canadians have been doing this for about 20 years and have been very successful with it. And they call it harvesting on the lawn. Because when you cut your corn uh, doing this and you have a crop like any ryegrass in your field, the whole field will look like a lawn after you're done cutting your corn. Uh, there's, of course, some, some issues with this. You have to be careful with herbicides and all that good stuff, but it is something to really consider. Try it on small acres. Uh, here's one of my farmers in Iowa doing the same thing, putting uh, a crop in, putting fertilizer and at the side dress and putting his uh, cover crop in all at the same time. And he's actually going a little earlier than that last picture. Now, on the other end of things, so getting the cover crop in as early as we can, we'd like to let it grow as long as we can. And in the past, especially if you're a beginner, we tell you to basically kill it pretty early. A lot of folks will kill... Uh, uh, cereal rye when it's only about this size. Uh, not that much biomass, of course, you get out of it. A lot of advantages for roots still. This field actually had roots going almost four feet deep in the soil profile with those tiny little cereal rye plants. Uh, and that is on glacial till soil in the northern part of uh, Indiana. Uh, if you really want to get that biomass and if you grow any legumes, in order to grow any nitrogen with a legume, it needs to be at half bloom before you terminate it. And that's what this would look like. And as a consequence, this is in early May, this is what your planting season will look like. Now, again, this is not cover crop 101. This gentleman has been growing cover crops. This is central Illinois. 
he has been growing cover crops for about 20 years by now, 15 years. And it took him several tries with the planter to get it through the hairy veg. And I'm sure there's pictures out there that are not as pretty as this one. And he didn't share those with me. This is the one I got after several tries when he actually could get his corn planted. I know quite a few farmers planting in living cover crops, again, to get that extra growth and that extra protection out of the cover crop, both for erosion control, nutrient uh, scavenging, all the good stuff. Most of you are probably familiar with planting uh, beans, soybeans into cereal rye, standing cereal rye, let it get very tall, plant your crop in there, picture from 2013. So farmers have been doing this for a long time. A lot of the questions in the chat were actually about planting corn into cereal rye. And unless you are very experienced with cover crops and you have many years under your belt, I highly uh, unrecommend doing corn into cereal rye. Uh, I know several farmers that are wildly successful with it and do quite well. The problem is the cereal rye crop you look at here probably has 150 pounds of nitrogen taken out of the ground that is in the above ground biomass. That is nitrogen that the young corn plant is normally counting on. So if you do anything with cereal rye and corn, make sure that you have fertilizer on the planter, preferably pop up and uh, two by two, and then be ready for a very early side dress on your corn because that cereal rye needs a lot of nitrogen. And uh, this is not the ideal setup for most farmers. So think about cereal rye uh, before you plant beans, not so much corn. And I'll probably get a whole bunch of pushback of farmers who've been doing this successfully for a long time, but it is not for beginners. Again, this farmer planted his beans on June 1st, and it was after a two inch rain the day before. Uh, there is no way you're going to get in regular fields uh, with our wet springs or tilled fields. Uh, that is the beauty of some of these cover crops. Uh, this farmer can get into his fields almost any time. And keep in mind, that cereal rye crop is still pulling water out of the soil. So with the extremely wet springs we've been having, letting cereal rye get taller in front of beans is probably a good thing. You have a mat of roots. There's probably four or five feet of roots underneath this crop a massive root system and this mat of residue to drive onto that actually makes it uh, easier for you to get in the field compared to tilled conditions. What is the best cover crop? Always one of my favorite questions and I throw it back right at you. What is better, a Ford or a Chevy? And I can just hear the discussion starting in the background. The chat will probably light up here with, with all sorts of remarks about how bad the other brand is. But my question is not what cover crop, but what for? What are you using this cup of cup for? Do you really need a pickup? Would you be better off with a Tesla or is all you need a bike? So think about those questions before you talk about what cover crop, what do you wanna do with it? And that is, what is your goal? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to stop erosion? Are you Are trying to get in your field earlier? You're working on soil health? All those things need to be answered. What is your experience level? Are you ready to tackle a 15-way cover crop mix with a couple of them that are kind of hard to uh, kill? Or what is your crop rotation? Do you have wheat in there? That opens an enormous window for manure applications and cover crop choices. Do you have cattle? I mean, you can graze some of this or you can even hay some of these cover crops. And where do you farm? Are you in the south? Are you in the north? Et cetera, et cetera. So what is the best cover crop? You get my academic answer to that. My uh, 20 years in academia have prepared me well when I was an extension guy. It depends. Cereal rye questions. We've answered a couple already when we were talking about the planting date and termination. Um, yes, if you, uh, if you plant them too late, all you got is cereal rye. But another thing for cereal rye is kind of interesting. We talked about putting beans into standing cereal rye. Uh, last year, or last year, last year didn't happen. In 2019, I was at, a, uh, at an extension meeting and one of the head agronomists of Bayer made the following statement when he was talking about uh, glyphosate resistant water hams and those kind of crops. The only good wheat control was cereal rye, 98% control. Uh, so I, I have to admit, I worked for Monsanto for a couple of years, but to hear an ex-Monsanto now by Bayer guy say that the best wheat control could be reached with a cover crop, that was kind of refreshing. So cereal rye does a fabulous job of weed control. Uh, it has a couple modes of action. Number one, it takes all the nitrogen out of the soil. So uh, soybean plants don't mind, corn plants and a lot of weeds do mind. 
it shades out a lot of wheat when it gets to stall. And then there's a chemical exuded by uh, cereal rye. It's called an allelopathy or a poison that goes into the soil that impacts small shallow seeded uh, crops, which is your annual winter annuals and then some of the other weeds and those uh, glyphosate resistant crops. That allelopathy does not impact your corn and soybeans. Those seeds are too large and they're planted too deep to really have an issue. The reason that corn doesn't do so well with cereal rice sometimes is the lack of nitrogen. The nitrogen has been taken away. So keep that in mind. Herbicides, um, so a cover crop can actually take the place of herbicides in some rotation. So that is the cool thing. However, officially we can probably not grow uh, cover crops because if you look at the setback of atrazine alone i think that's 18 months so, so officially you shouldn't be able to plant cover crops because atrazine could still easily take them out and it happens some years if we don't get an average year with average moisture average temperatures uh, herbicides can really damage our uh, cover crops um, some cover crops are much more sensitive when i worked in the state of washington i remember a canola field this was a commercial canola field not a cover crop died and we had to trace it back to a herbicide that was applied four years earlier. So some are very sensitive to, to some of the herbicides and then some herbicides are much harder on cover crops than others. And a really quick Google search last night brought this up. Uh, this is from the Ohio State University, herbicide residue considerations for fall cover crop establishments. And there's some other publications out there that can really address that. Some tables that basically list the herbicides that have the biggest impact. And keep in mind, if we start doing goofy things like putting cover crops in at V3 or V4, you need to be even more uh, careful with that. And those tables are all on the internet, uh, Penn State, Purdue, Ohio State, they all have this information out there. Uh, just Google that in interaction of herbicides with cover crops. And you see Prowl and Callisto in this case really are harsh on, on the plots where we are trying to uh, intercede in our standing corn. So that information is all out there. Look it up, see how it fits in your uh, herbicide program and what you potentially can change out there. Economics, that is the big one on cover crops. How can I afford cover crops? And we, CTIC is one of the contracts I have. We do a survey about every year together with Sustainable Ag Research and Education program from the USDA. And we find that the majority of farmers start cover crops and try cover crops without any uh, subsidies. So that is a good thing to know. There's a couple of farmers uh, that we work with uh, that are willing to show their whole bookkeeping online. One of them is uh, Rick Clark with the Clark Land and Cattle Company. He's on the Indiana, Illinois line about central Indiana. He looked at his 2011 and 2019 data of inputs on the farm and he found that he is saving an enormous amount of money now that he's moved into no-till and cover crops. And this is a large farm. He has about 7,000 acres and he saves about $100 per acre every year by going to no-till cover crops. And now he's actually transitioning some of his acres into organic. So huge savings to be had. Uh, a 5,000 acre farm here in central Indiana, the Rulon farm, and you can just Google these guys and this information is on there. They did the extensive side-by-side -side testing cover crops versus no cover crops. And they take credits for some things, not for others. They come up with about $80 an acre every year that they get as a benefit or on average. Some years it's more, some years it's less. And then of course, our hometown hero here, Eric Niemeyer, he worked with the American Farmland Trust and they did a case study with him. And when he puts all his uh, cover crop versus no cover crop in a spreadsheet, he comes up with, with a very nice $40 an acre benefit, net benefit of using those cover crops. What I like about Eric's, calculation, he actually even took money out of his benefit for attending conferences and learning about cover crops. So this is a very realistic number, uh, this $40 an acre benefit he has out there on his farm. Last thing, some value added covers. Uh, keep in mind, uh, people ask all these things about improved cover crops. Cover crops are a very slim margin item. For seed dealers, cover crops only work if they can sell something else, like uh, forage crops or something. So in order to get more value out of cover crops and get bigger bre breeding programs going on those, uh, we need to consider using cover crops to harvest them. Some people uh, do cereal rye for seed production. 
Now, be careful with that because it needs to be cleaned. If you buy cereal rye and it comes from uh, another farmer, make sure it's gone through a cleaner. Cover crops, hay and grazing, of course, uh, are options. Uh, and Eric can throw up all the, the problems with hay and grazing cover crops. Number one, you don't want to own cattle. So I think we need to go to uh, websites like eHarmony, but then for farmers where we get cattle grazers and crop producers together and, and get the cattle on those cropland acres. And I know quite a few farmers that are doing that. In some industries, that's already common, like e equipment sharing and all that stuff. Yes, you need to fence. Yes, there's issues with water. I know, I know, I know. It can be a real issue, but it would be very beneficial for both the grazer and the cover crop grower. And a couple questions about greenhouse, uh, greenhouses and hoop houses and cover crops in there. Uh, interesting, I called some of my farmer friends who have those things and the answer I get back from them, I do not want any uh, cover crops in the greenhouse. That space is way too expensive, way too valuable. And uh, I have commercial crops growing in there year round. So that's their opinion. I tend to agree because I couldn't come up with what you need in a greenhouse either. In closing, buy your cover crops from a reliable source. Like I said, some farmers are starting to grow cover crops and bag them, basically brown bagging them. And I saw a large white bag with a Sharpie written on there, it said rye. That is not buying cover crop seed. If that doesn't have a seed tag that gives you the emergence and it gives you the percentage of weeds that they found in there, it is just not a good thing. So buy it from a reliable source, make sure that that seed is clean and that it is uh, has high emergence ratios. And uh, otherwise you can get yourself, you basically buy somebody else's weed problem if you don't do that. And with that, I'd like to uh, open it up for questions. Eric and I are available for that. So I'll stop sharing my screen here, Mary, and give it back to you. Thanks, Hans. There are quite a few questions in the Q&A and we have, Bowdoin oh Fisher. we have Bowdoin Fisher here to help um, field those questions to Hans and Eric. Um, Bowdoin is a water quality associate in Northeast Ohio. So um, welcome Bowdoin and thank you, Hans. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Hans, for the presentation. Really appreciate that. A lot of good information and uh, really addressed a lot of the questions that have been coming up the past few weeks. So we do have a few more and I'll try to start moving through them. I'm just going to go from the top. Uh, we did have people vote on these questions. So uh, some at the top are the most liked. So actually, this one's a little less agronomic, but I, if any, either you or Eric has comments or experience with this, um, Please comment on the concerns involving cereal rye roots plugging tile lines. <laughs> Eric, you want me to take, tackle that one or you want to go there? Go for it. <laughs> I'll comment too, but go for it. Yeah, okay. Um, so yes, it does happen. Tile lines get plugged by all sorts of roots. Um, and I've had extensive discussions with tile contractors on this. We've had forums on this thing. We had farmers on the phone. I've been in the field with farmers digging those enormous holes and getting these balls of roots out of their tiles is like birthing a calf. And of course, it's wet, it's cold, it's miserable, and uh, it is not a cool thing to do. It happens, but we find in 99% of the cases, it has something to do with the tile system. Uh, there's either a place where the water is sticking in the, in the tile system, or there is a narrow place where a rock or something got in next to the tile line, so there's an obstruction out there. Keep in mind, if a tile system operates well, it is either completely dry or it has flowing water in it. it. There should be no water in that system when it's not raining. So there should be no environment for crops to grow into. In a, in a good tile system, you see roots coming in from the top of the tile and they're just hanging there in the air. And they shouldn't stay in there because there is nothing for them to have there because the water is gone as soon as the rain stops and, and it shouldn't be the case. I've had several cases, especially in farmer installed drainage systems where, where you get these, there's either a, a sag in the line or like I said, a rock on the side where you where the, the roots grow in, tile, in, in, in tiles all the time and they die, corn roots when the crop dies and then they wash out of the system. And with some of the new inventions we have, for instance, where the laterals come into a main, they have these bayonet fittings now where you push them in rather than drill a hole in the main line and then have a connector and those bayonets actually stick into the main line and they make it a little narrower and those are places where roots coming out of the system often plug up 
and those are uh, roots that are dead already. We've had uh, root samples sent into Purdue for DNA analysis to figure out what those roots were. It is such a mess. We can't even figure out whether they're cover crop roots or corn roots. Cereal rye seems to be a little more uh, prevalent in doing that because it has such enormously long roots. I had one farmer really, really mad with me. I had him signed up for a program and I worked intensively with him and man, I, I, I drove out to the farm and I was, I was uh, afraid I was gonna get really in trouble with the guy. And he planted cereal rye again that fall because he thought the benefits of cereal rye were far outweighing what the cover crops were doing. Great, thanks Hans. Uh, Eric, did you say you wanted to comment? I, I was just gonna say, I've not had a lot of experience with roots plugging from cover crop plugging tile. So I really don't have a lot of comment there, no. Okay. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Great comments, Hans, on the how that may be primarily in most cases due to the drainage system. Um, next question is when you, uh, so on practice here, and I know Eric, you mentioned that you uh, do use roller crimper, but the question is when using roller crimper, should the blade touch the ground or if not, how far from the ground should it be? Yeah, um, on ours, you know, We've been rolling um, mechanically terminating cover crop for about three years now. Um, on ours, yes, we do have the um, we have the full weight of the roller crimper on the ground, the wheels off the ground. So um, you know we've got a pretty good cover base in there. So is are the the chevron blades themselves actually touching the ground? You know I don't know. In some areas, probably it's touching the dirt. Um, we've not had any issue with any sort of crop disturbance or, or what have you. So in order to get uh, the, the actual crimping and the termination that we're looking for, particularly on the cereal rye, you know, I do want that weight there to, to put that crimp into the, the uh, cover crop itself. Great, appreciate that. And then there are a couple more questions around crimpers actually so uh go for it if either of you want to jump in on these um the next is on blade design uh, perhaps what i guess uh what you particularly use eric but what is the best design for crimper blades uh for example straight across halfway multiple v's per row uh and how far from the base should those blades be um I don't really have a, I guess I'll step back before I bought my roller crimper and I've got an I and J roller crimper, which is, you know, the red and yellow ones that a lot of you probably seen out there. Um, before I had that, I tried using a, an old uh, call to packer. I tried using some rolling baskets and just to see, you know, how they would work. Um, you know, I had varying levels of success with that. Um, probably more frustration than success, largely because I was wrapping a lot of the crop because of the way those units are designed. They're not designed to roll and crimp uh, cover crop, whereas the, the design purpose built machine has guards and protection from that. The other big issue was I really wasn't getting a termination. I was laying that cover crop down. Um, and, you know, I, I've had a lot of trial and error experiences. I'm a farmer first guys and I farm to make money. Make no mistake about it. I'm definitely interested in preserving our natural resources but I farm to make money. Um, one of those experiences I had was no tilling corn into standing cereal rye. And that was the first experience I had doing that. Um, I had six foot tall cereal rye and I did not lay that cereal rye down. That corn plant came out of the ground and just fought for that sunlight. And ultimately I had real tall spindly corn because it was fighting to get out of that cereal rye. Um, the next year I said, okay, I got to lay that cereal rye down, but I wasn't ready to give up the chemical termination. So that's when I tried the, the, the call to packer and ultimately a, a, a rolling basket. I was effective at laying the cereal rye down and I took care of that that spindly growth issue and it also helped with weed suppression, but I wasn't killing the cover crop that way. And I, my goal was to get to where I'm actually terminating the cover crop mechanically and avoiding the use of that chemistry. You don't get that until you've got that, that crimping effect. I don't have experience with anything other than the chevron blades. And when I say chevron blades, it's a kind of a zigzag on the, the roller itself. I've got a 30 foot roller and it's, it's uh, 
uh, it's got the wings that fold up. The center section is about 15 feet wide. And, uh, you know, so the, the chevrons run the full length of each of those rollers, so. Yeah, there's all sorts of designs out there. Do you put weight on the wings of that one, Eric, to make sure that the wings come down or do you have hydraulics that push them down? That's a great question, Hans. And I, I do not, so my roller crimper is is able to be filled with water or used motor oil or whatever. I don't need to do that. I've right. not put any of that in there. Um, and no, I don't put the weight. What I do is when I lower those wings, I'll lower them and put the, the hydraulics in float so they'll sit you know, level right. with the ground and then they'll kind of float over the ground. So I'm not digging or pushing anywhere on there. I'm allowing it to kind of float as I go. And I've got, there's plenty of weight. That thing, it weighs a ton, yeah. a lot. And you need that. Yeah. yeah. So I've seen all sorts of designs. You see planters that actually have uh, rolling units in front of every row. Uh, I have seen people that have a roller in front of the center section of the tractor. And so it goes before the tires and then the rest of the roller behind it. It seems to work uh, as long as you like Eric said, you have that weight on there. Uh, my general observation is that more farmers are starting to plant first and then roll second. And number one, that gives the cover crop a little more time in the field, what, yep. what survives the planter. And especially if you have a mix, if you have cereal rye with Austrian winter peas, for instance, those peas grow a little longer and they have a chance to create some more nitrogen uh, before the before you actually uh, take them out with the roller. The other thing is direction is much easier. If you roll first and then plant, a lot of people say, then you have to follow the, the roller pretty well. Otherwise your planter goes across a lot of residue and could have issues. So yeah, the Chevron of course is so you don't bounce out of the seat. If you have bars running straight around you, you get this thumping effect and it will shake you out of your seat. That's why they came up with Chevron. But uh, yeah, you need to crimp, crimp that crop. And uh, there was a question about hairy vetch I saw. And again, same thing, uh, as long as you, you get it uh, crimped uh, and this the picture I showed you, the farmer was doing it at the time of planting. And then he basically uh, came back with the roller and, and killed the rest of it. Um, yeah, you need to, kink that stem on a cereal ride to actually kill it, like Eric said. And I, I would just second what you're saying, Hans, about planting first. My opinion, my perspective, I want least amount of obstruction or challenge out there when I go to plant. We do plant everything green. We've got our planter set up specifically for that. And I have no problem getting that seed placed exactly where I want. Then I can go back afterwards and, and roll and crimp that. Um, another thing that we're, we're gaining experience on, and I say gaining um, experience on, is, is rolling cover crop in soybeans after the soybeans have emerged. And uh, I know there's studies out there that show that that actually helps the soybean crop perform, putting a little stress on there, which seems counterintuitive, but uh, yeah. there's a lot of, lot of work being done around that right now. Right. And Odin, if I may, we talk about cereal rye and rolling a lot. If you start with cereal rye, start a little on the light side uh, to get an experience with that crop. Um, most people probably put about a bushel of rye in, but if you're just starting out with that, maybe go a little light, but don't expect too much wheat control if you do that. And, and actually kill it a little earlier, maybe before planting, just to get the hang of it with cereal rye. People that are really dealing with Palmer amaranth and some of the other weeds that are really tough go as high as two or three bushels of rye in cereal rye in their fields, and that's for weed control. But boy, you better have gear to take care of that much rye, like a good roller and a good setup on your planter, because that can be that. That's for number one. Psychologically, it's very in, in, uh, impressive to go into a field with crops that high and that thick. And you need to still get that crop in there because we're all in the business of making money and not just having pretty cereal rye in the field. So be ready for that if you go to higher rates. Great discussion. Thank you both for that. And um, seems like we have had, I think we've gotten most of the questions about crimping, I guess just as one final thought on that for folks since there was a lot of interest in it, you might've touched on it, but just a quick comment on, um, is, cert, is there a certain uh, maturity that the cover crop has to be at in order to crimp effectively? Um, thoughts on that? Eric, when do you kill it? 
Yeah, cereal rye has got to be at minimum boot stage. Um, you know, we we have tried pushing the limits on on getting as much growth of our cover crop out there as possible before we terminate. Um, so you know, we've gone as late as as flowering. Definitely want to get it before it goes to seed. Hey, if I may go ugly and commercial here for just a sec. Uh, first of all, Eric runs a business called uh, Buckeye Soul Solutions. They actually provide that service of getting cover crops in. He's not the only one. Other people are doing it too with a high boy. So that is something to consider if you if you try that getting the cover crop in early and you're not a fan of airplanes. Um, folks like Eric can actually help you out there and do some custom work to get that into the ground. The other plug I want to put in, I gave you some resources early on. There's an organization called No-Till Farmer. And I see Julia's on the, on the chat with us uh, and, and she's the editor of the magazine. That is a great magazine. It's cheap and it's chock full of farmer information every month and online about no-till and cover crops. And uh, of course this year we had to have the no-till conference, uh, not in person, but virtual. But that is my favorite conference of the year to learn about cover crops and how farmers are actually dealing with that. And then of course the no-till that goes so well hand in hand with that. So no-till farmer, uh, just Google it. It's lesser to publications and it's a great resource. And she just put a post out there about roller crimpers. Uh, the original design came from Rodale with the Chevrons, the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. And uh, Jeff just came out with a new book on that. Great. Thanks for sharing those resources, Hans. And I see Eric also put his contact info in the chat. So that's great. Thank you for that. And I guess while we've been talking, we've had quite a few questions come in. So I'm going to keep moving. Uh, the top Good. question right now is I have had three different farmers comment that they've had significant yield losses, 20 bushels to the acre plus in corn fields planted in cover crops compared to fields that were not planted in cover crops. What are we doing wrong? So I guess the main question being maybe what would be the, the most common thing that you've seen of what goes wrong, I guess, or where you see it. I really need to talk to those farmers to figure out exactly what they did. I mean, when I used to work for Monsanto, I saw enormous damage to crops with herbicides and yield losses there too. And we know most of us use herbicides to control weeds. So it really depends on circumstances, what you do. Yeah, something obviously went wrong. If you terminate a cover crop too late in a dry year, you bet that's really going to hurt your yield. And, and we don't know whether it's going to be a dry year, but we know that if you have several years of cover crop out there, that is going to really mitigate some of the dry year effects. So it, it, it's very complicated. You really need to look at each situation. Cereal rye from the corn, I mentioned that already. If you don't pour the nitrogen on there, that is a recipe for disaster. Yep. So be careful with that. Uh, yeah, and, and the moisture. Those are the two big ones that, that can really hurt your crop. Eric, what's your, have you had any really bad effects with cover crops? I, again, yeah. learning experiences, right? And, and yeah. I, the, the biggest thing I would say, I would echo what you just said, Hans. And, and again, I'm going to make some assumptions here that we really would need to know exactly what cover crops were out there, especially ahead of that corn. But my guess is it was probably cereal rye. And was there, you know, enough allowance made for that carbon and nitrogen tie up um, ahead of corn? You can use cereal rye ahead of corn as part of a cover crop mix and do it successfully, but you've got to know how that nutrient is cycling in your soil. If you've got the cycling going well and, and your nitrogen is available, then, then you're okay. But if you're heavy cereal rye or only cereal rye and you don't make up for that nitrogen um, tie up, it can be catastrophic. As we, we know as farmers, our yield is made at the very beginning, right? You know, on corn. So if you've got that lack of nitrogen, the corn starts struggling, that's probably got a lot to do with that challenge that, that those folks are faced. We talked about not addressing cover crops 101, but let me throw a quick plug out here. Start small, do it on a, just a couple acres. You've got to really reduce the amount of tillage you do. Otherwise cover crops are not going to be successful for you. And the simplest recipe in a corn soybean rotation is put a light rate of cereal rye in front of your beans and put right after the beans, put oats and radishes in the field in front of your corn because they both will freeze out. So you have the opportunity to uh, just plant your corn into a, basically a bare ground, either a stale seed bed, or if you feel like you need to do spring tillage, you still have those options. Yeah, that is the easiest just... way to get started. 
Let me just comment here too, folks. I, I put my phone number out there. I genuinely want to talk to anybody that's got questions. I'm, I don't care if you're just beginning or if, if you've been doing this a long time. And you know, I, I'd love to talk with you about being successful and share ideas and hopefully learn from some of you folks too. Not a sales pitch. So please, you know, if, if after this call, if we can be of assistance, please reach out. Yeah, and, and sorry if I put you in an awkward position by plugging your company out there. Just know you no, do no. guys do great work. And I'm not getting paid by Eric to say that. <laughs> so I only put my email out there because holy moly, guys, after a webinar like this, my phone just goes off the hook for weeks if I put my phone number out there. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm available by email to answer some of your questions. Online, there are so many resources out there, so much stuff that, uh, that, that you can get answered online. Now, there's a lot of misinformation too, and that's the problem. So talk to local farmers. All those guys, I showed you their economics. They're all in farmer groups, in peer groups, where they talk to farmers that are of similar mindset, and they're not necessarily in the neighborhood. They're across the state or even across the whole Midwest or nationwide. And they get together on a regular basis by phone or in the olden days, they got on somebody's farm and got together and talk about these systems. That is really where you learn the most by hanging with farmers. Even as an extension specialist, uh, I was always hanging with farmers because that's where I learned the most uh, in addition to what my researchers told me. Mary, that's great. You guys have a compaction webinar and I'll probably attend that too. Uh, uh, OSU has really been one of the premier universities uh, with research on uh, compaction over the years. Randall Reeder, of course, did groundbreaking work on that. Cover crops are actually working really well with fighting compaction, much better than any of the tools. I've done compaction research myself at universities too, and cover crops can break that up and keep the roots in there. And both natural compaction and man-made compaction, they can do a good job. The most, uh, most extreme example I saw was in central Illinois or southern Illinois, where people have fragile pan soils, clay layers deeper in there. Five years of annual ryegrass broke up and opened those natural fragile pans and actually gave the farmers, instead of a two or a two and a half foot soil profile with basically concrete underneath, broke it open to a long, big, wide open soil and their yields went to levels where nobody would have ever thought they could go. And that is with a minor investment of a five-year cover crop. So they can do a lot more than nutrient uh, scavenging, uh, uh, erosion control and, and weed control. Cover crops really can take care of a lot of our issues with our soils. Great, thanks Hans and Mary, lots of great comments. Um, we've touched on this and Hans, you touched on this in the presentation, but um, top question right now still is with corn soybean harvest being in mid-October and beyond, uh, are there any other winter cereal, cereal grains, oats, wheat, triticale, uh, et cetera, besides rye that will work as a cover crop? And are there any winter legumes, broadleafs, et cetera? Yeah, and I would, again, I would really advise you, number one, talk locally, see what other people have done and what works and go to the Midwest Cover Crop Council and uh, see what, what the planting dates are and all those different crops for your specific locale. You may be just a little too far north to get some of these things in unless you put them into the standing crop. But again, some of those legumes have large seeds and, uh, and they are probably not a real good option to get into the crop early and they really work better if you have wheat in the rotation. Now, Eric, you're in the middle of the state. Uh, what, what is your experience with getting stuff in other than high boy maybe, or what, what mixes do you get into your uh, crop so you can get it in corn? Yeah, and, and, and not to sound like a commercial, but truthfully, we, we built the high boy machine to service our own needs and get the cover out there early. Um, we, we do the custom work to promote the, the soil health benefits of cover crop and also to truthfully pay for the machine. But really that that is the key, Hans, is is getting getting those covers out there and established early. If you've got wheat in the rotation, which last year 2020 was the first year we planted wheat on our farm. We added that back in the rotation and that opened up a huge opportunity to um, broaden um, the spectrum of, of the benefit of cover crop out there um, ahead of corn. So that was really exciting. Um, we have had limited success 
Um, particularly the last several years in Ohio, we've, we've had pretty mild starts of the winter. Um, we've had limited success with Crimson Clover and Harry Vetch um, going in um, um, after soybean harvest. Um, as, as long as the soybeans were an earlier maturity, um, you know, guys were able to get that out there. But again, you know, the biggest challenge, I, I'm not sure the weather and timing, you know, from that perspective is as big a challenge as how busy guys are during harvest season and do they really want to take the time to establish a cover crop at that point. So, and it's funny you mentioned that because I would have always thought it'd be easier to get cover crops established in beans, but that's where we usually seem to have the issues. Now, keep in mind if you put yep. legumes in there, most of those need to, uh, um, um, Boy, drawing a huge blank here. They need they need to inoculant in there. Yes. To uh, to get started, and yes. I've made the mistake of just putting covers in there, and you don't get a very good stand unless you have to specific inoculant for that. That is critical, very critical. But I don't know why beans is so much tougher to get cover crops established in. Uh, the other thing about wheat, of course, people talk a lot about the uh, the, the cost and not making enough money on the wheat. Uh, so we have had farmers that did side by side. Half of the field was in uh, double crop soybeans. The other half was in a multi-mix uh, of cover crops. And they found that the benefit of the cover crops to the subsequent uh, uh, corn crop was so high. And they, even two years later, they found benefits in their bean crop again, that it really mm -hmm. paid to give up double crop soybeans and go for these cover crop mixes and take the benefit. And if you yeah, if you do an annual spreadsheet, it doesn't look pretty, but if you look at three-year spreadsheet over the rotation, they saw a definite benefit of doing what you are doing with your wheat yep. area. Because you probably down. could do double crop soybeans where you are. Yeah, we could. And, and we we tried some of that on our farm this last year, honestly, where where we did double crop some beans and, and we had a pretty decent yield. I think we yielded on average about 32 bushel the acre on double crop beans. Um, and uh, we're planning on a soil test here this spring to see, you know, some of the benefits of the multi-species cover crop. Just to give you an idea what we put out there in the multi-species last year, we got sunflower, we've got uh, uh, winter peas, chickling vetch, Balanza clover, crimson clover, hairy vetch, radish, buckwheat, um, flax, barley, oats, and the inoculant. So, you know, we'll see lots of legumes. That's ahead of corn, of course. One quick comment on, you, you made a good point. This is a really good point on the timing of establishment of cover crops in a bean crop. Um, our experience has been, the best timing to start the, that establishment and to, to put that, that cover crop to the ground, about 15, 20% of those bean leaves need to start turning and yellowing um, in order to allow adequate sunlight to get to the ground. If you go in too early, the canopy is just too heavy and it does not allow the sunlight to get to the ground for establishment. We've also found in, you know, particularly dense corn crops that can, you know, be a little bit of a challenge too. But you know, we we get much more success in getting established early cover crop in in cornfields than uh, than soybeans if the timing's not right. Right. Great conversation. Appreciate it. Um, so we have had a couple questions actually shifting gears slightly um, to some some vegetable producers and actually there's one on gardening as well. But um, vegetable producer. Uh, looking to put cover crop between wide rows, preferably something they cut with sickle bar, roll or crimp to make a mat. So kind of about weed control actually to block weeds and keep fruit off the soil. Um, also one, um, um, must've got lost down here somewhere, but basically are there any, do you have any thoughts? I know Eric, grain crops, but Hans, any thoughts on vegetable producers? And yeah, with the wide there? rows, you have a lot of opportunities with cover crops. However, in vegetable production, you need to be extremely careful what cover crop you pick. Because uh, cover crops like radishes and, and, and some of the others are, uh, they, they have all sorts of chemicals in there that could interfere with some of your crops. Uh, and they could, uh, they could, for instance, counteractively work with crops like broccoli. So you have to be very careful which cover crop you pick. Some of our row crop farmers are actually using this wide row concept. They're going back to 60 inch row corn and they put uh, massive cover crops, uh, like three or four rows of cover crop in between there and they get fabulous weed control and they keep their number of uh, seeds per acre about the same. 
that seems to work. We've had some, some great success with that. But again, in vegetable production, um, yeah, it, chemical, chemical uh, killing, of course, is really hard. Although I've seen guys with hooded sprayers go out there and do that. But a lot of those horticultural crops are extremely sensitive to uh, chemicals. So we've got to be careful with that. Rolling, yeah, you you, you could of course use things like uh, like uh, cereal rye, uh, but again, uh, you'd need a very specific roller that can go between the rows and then take that crop out. Uh, the advantage, of course, is you have a nice mat of residue laying there, uh, safe moisture, uh, weed control. Yeah, there are options, and uh, I would. Definitely suggest you look for a forum online of vegetable growers. Southern Michigan has quite a bit of vegetable growers uh, dealing with cover crops. There, there should be enormous opportunities. My garden here at home um, is a little dictated by our dog. Our dog really loves oats. So I always have to put oats in the fall and then she goes out there and eats until the first frost comes and then she's all missed that the oats are gone. But um, I usually have oats in there. I don't want to have to kill anything in the, in the spring. So I, I have heavy oats, I put some clovers in there. And I like that balanza clover that Eric mentioned because it has a big hollow stem and you can just walk over it and basically kill the stuff and uh, it breaks. It's so much easier to kill than, than, uh, than crimson clover or some of the others. And in horticulture, you can probably actually grow living clovers between your crops to, to have a living cover there, especially if water is not a, an issue with you, if you have irrigation. Uh, then, then those living uh, legumes can actually be a good thing to do. We we played with all sorts of crops in orchards too. What is the most efficient one to grow in there and have a living cover underneath the trees? Uh, we've done the same thing in walnut plantations. You've got to be a little careful. Uh, some crops in walnut plantations have a negative interaction. I think it's fescue that doesn't work so well under a uh, walnut tree. So yeah, there are options in anything beyond way beyond uh, just your regular row crops. And we have actually seen row crop farmers move, not necessarily to the vegetable area, but to uh, multiple crop rotations. And a lot of farmers are now using cereal rye as a crop that they let go to seed and then going back in rotation. And so their, their rotations get to be very different than just corn, soybean, or even corn, soybean, wheat. Thanks for the thoughts on that, Hans. Um, we have a couple questions here about nutrient management uh, related to cover crops. So I'll try to summarize a couple of those, but one of them is, are there any just general effects, cover crops effects on uh, macro soil nutrient levels? And I know you've touched on the nitrogen component, any thoughts? There's also one about, um, are there cover crops that scavenge for potassium and micronutrients? So maybe some comments on phosphorus, potassium, micros. Right, we've mainly looked at the big ones at uh, NP and K. And uh, we know that uh, especially phosphorus is pretty contentious right now because most research shows that the phosphorus is really bound up by cover crops. And a paper came out of Kansas State University that shows that uh, cover crops can potentially add more uh, phosphorus to the runoff water. So something in Northern Ohio, we don't need at this point, but that's only one research paper versus a whole bunch of others that show it works really well. The micros, there's a lot of research going on about that. and. Uh, Cover crops do a lot of things we don't totally understand, like buckwheat is supposedly really interacting with some of the micros. And it is this tiny spindly plant with barely any roots, but it exudes so many chemicals into the soil that it frees up some of those micros. And, and there's a lot of research going on. I can give you just a blank statement about, hey, this cover crop is the best or that cover crop is the best. But yeah, keep an eye on that and so what we're finding out about that. Uh, Generally speaking, just very generic, if you have a lot of cover crops in your rotation, you're in a no-till system, you will have more availability of a lot of nutrients because your biology and your soil gets to be much more active. Uh, a lot of the, the, the nutrients we've been adding to our soils is basically because our soils were more or less dead. With all the tillage we did, uh, we didn't have a lot of biology out there and you needed to basically spoon feed your plants. And once that biology comes back, keep in mind, you're sitting on over 2000 pounds of nitrogen per acre in the soil and then thousands of pounds of phosphorus that are just bound up by the soil. You get that biology cranking and a lot of that stuff is cycled again and becomes available again. And a lot of farmers that I work with that have long-term no-till, long-term cover crops are way be below the university recommended rates of uh, nutrients they need to put on their soils. And I'm not 
advocating that because that's a very risky proposition. Strip trials is the only way you can find out whether you can back off on nutrients on your farm, whether your soil is ready for that. But the other thing is our soil tests we do were all designed in tillage systems. So all of a sudden we, we pull a soil sample for nutrients and it tells you you need to put a whole bunch of nitrogen on there. And I know farmers that don't put anything on there and still have record breaking yields. So we probably need to start shifting the way we take our samples and the way we do our lab analysis to more reflect that active biology we have in some of those long-term no-till and cover crop soils again. So that yeah, everything is kind of shifting. And I know a farmer knows how to deal with shifts, that's their livelihood, but now we throw this ranch in there and that's really making things even more complicated for you. Although there is a lot of money to be made uh, by following these active biology soils. Yeah, no, I would agree with you, Hans, too. I mean, the, having a, a, the active polycultures developing in the, in our our systems here, we're, we're reinvigorating the biology and the nutrient cycling in the soil. And that's what will allow us to eventually start to reduce the use of of chemical and, and industrial fertilizers and pesticides and whatnot on our farms too. Somebody had asked a question before about, about the, the herbicide program in corn that we use. And we don't use any her, or, uh, residual herbicides on our farm at all. We haven't since 2014. And, you know, in the beginning it was rough, you know, but now we've got, got good crop or uh, cover crop residue and, and, and protection to help you know, guard against weeds and whatnot. Our fields aren't perfectly clean, but we do not have weed problems to speak of. And again, it's a cycle. You've got to build up to this. You can't just go cold turkey. Okay, I'm going to cut out fertilizer. So you've got to get the nutrient cycling properly and get the, the, the biology working in the soil first. Yeah, and thank you for saying that. Uh, you need to get there. When I throw up a slide of Rick Clark saving a hundred bucks an acre, Guys, that is after a lot of years of no-till and a lot of years of cover crops and slowly working his way into organic. So Rick doesn't use any lime, any commercial fertilizer, barely any manure. He basically grows his own uh, nitrogen and nutrients in his biological system. You cannot get there from a corn soybean rotation overnight. That's going to take you a decade or more with very intense management to get there. So uh, I like those examples because it shows really where the cutting edge right now is what we can achieve with no-till and cover crop. Uh, but we need to take baby steps to get there. And the one thing you need to keep in mind, all these systems take a lot more management. Uh, you need to really think through things, talk to other farmers, take, edu take educational classes, go spend time with farmer groups. It, it takes a lot of management to get these systems to be successful. It is not you walk to the co-op, you go buy a couple bags of stuff and it'll work for you. It's a very different system of farming and uh, it is not for everybody. So right. honestly, I mean, it's change, change, change. Change is very uncomfortable. I always do this dorky thing, cross your arms and now do it the other way around. That is not comfortable. And that is what, in a very much larger scale, that is what it is with, uh, with the cover crops and no-till systems. Big changes, management, 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 that's all there's involved in that. But there you have a yeah. lot of mentors out there, a lot of people that support you. And right now with uh, the carbon sequestration and all that stuff going on, there might actually be some money in it for farmers mm -hmm. to add on to the system. Will it last? I have no clue. Is it just greenwashing by companies or government? I have no clue. But if they're wanting to pay you to put carbon into the ground right now, I take it. That is great because we need that carbon back in the ground. We used to have a lot more carbon in the ground. We've lost at least half of it. If you put it back in the ground with your cover crops and reducing tillage, your soils will really work much better for you. Hans, you, you made a really good point there in, about the management, and it does. It does definitely take more management, but to be clear, it can also be done on scale. You provided two really good examples before, both Ruans and, and Clark um, are farming, you know, on a large scale, and they're doing this very effectively and successfully and, and have the data to prove the benefits financially as well as soil health-wise. But what I love, Eric, is you doing it on a relatively small scale, and it works for you too. Absolutely, so that that shows on the whole yeah. spectrum these systems really work. It so. does. I think we're gonna um, end there. I really. Oh, 
And that was such a good time with Where Eric. Going? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I really thank both of you for joining us this morning and for your willingness to share. That was um, really, really educational for me. I learned a lot and it's really nice to get your perspective and nice to hear from you together. On the, on the last note that Hans was making, I just wanna remind you um, that if you're looking for other people to talk to that are doing um, cover crops and um, implementing some of these things that you wanna try, this Facebook group is a good place to start um, for discussion. Eric's part of that yep. group. Um, and a lot of you are probably, I'm part of it. And a lot of our speakers that we've had are on there and um, they do share information on Facebook and also um, meet. So I think that's a really good point. Hans is holding up the cover crops field guide there, which you can actually get online on the Midwest cover crops website. Right, very um, useful information. And um, also I'll mention Hans referred to Rick Clark. Um, he is coming to speak here with our group on March 4th. Um, so he'll be sharing with us on that day and we'll have a little bit, um, I think it's an hour long session. Yeah, that don't, don't miss that one. Don't miss that one. That's a good one. But Not again, that this isn't way, a good one too, but. There. So, <laughs> but he, he is great. And yeah. what I love about Rick is he, he just is willing to share. He throws yeah. his books open. He shows exactly what he does. That doesn't mean you can just go home and do it. Be, be careful, start slow, but that is where you could end up and it's very successful. He has livestock in rotation, by the way. So, sorry, Mary. Oh, no, no, thank you. Um, just lastly, let's just thank Eric and Hans for being with us today. And I wanna thank all of you for um, joining our discussion this morning. And I hope to see you all next time on February 18th for our compaction discussion.